Um, all right, so today I wanted to talk, uh, today and Thursday, about uh, personal conduct of uh, reporters, uh, reporters and editors, journalists. Um, and f first to start, well, let me say this. First, uh, there's basically uh, kind of two, two aspects to this question. One is how do journalists sort of comport themselves uh, in going about the work uh, in a way that serves the ethics of the profession. Um, and the other is the duties and responsibilities of journalists to the, expose the misconduct of others, including colleagues. Um, largely, I'll deal with the second question on Thursday. And in fact, one of the questions, one of the things you'll read um, in your handout is a report that was done uh, by a number of senior journalists uh, on a scandal at USA Today involving a reporter named Jack Kelly, uh, who was found to have fabricated some sources. And I, what's interesting about the reading, I, I hope you'll find, um, is the examination of the sort of newsroom practices of USA Today and how this came to light. Um, yes, please. So, also about that, Kelly, the link uh -huh. that you gave Did it not work? Page? Don't worry, because this is the report that would link to it. Uh, so you'll get it uh, when you read that, when you get the handout. Um, sorry about these links. Some of them uh, just have not functioned the way I expected them to. Um, but let me start this conversation then with something that was sort of left over from last week, although in some ways it's, I'm glad it was because it's more relevant to today's conversation, which is the question of whether it is ever ethical for a journalist to break the law. Um, I'll give you my short answer is yes, uh, but, but, uh, but I say that without our lawyers uh, present because I'm not sure they would answer it the same way. Um, you know, it's, that's a glib answer, obviously, and the, the really the more important answer is that any decision uh, to break the law has to be made only after the most serious consideration uh, and discussion uh, in a newsroom. You don't cavalierly break any law, because um, for the obvious reason that you could get in a lot of trouble. Um, as we've talked about and we talked about last week, you know, the law sets the general parameters of not just journalistic uh, behavior, but of human behavior. I mean, it, it proscribes what you are su not supposed to do in the interests of society. So breaking any law, breaking any law intentionally, obviously breaks a certain ethical compact in the sense that this is the, this is the agreement that citizens have with their government, that the government will responsibly pass laws and that citizens will obey them. So if you're going to break that, you have to break it um, in the service of some very important principle. There is a sort of classic you know, ethical dilemma that's posed, you know, particularly for people who consider themselves pacifists. Imagine that it's, you know, it's 1936 and you're alone in a room with Adolf Hitler and you have a vision of the future. Um, is it moral, is it ethical to kill him? Um, and, you know, that's, a, that's an unsolvable question. Um, but clearly what you know in that situation is that it would be against the law to do so. Um, it would be against most, you know, most people's morality or ethical principles to commit murder. Um, if you do so in the service of saving, you know, tens of millions of lives down the road, does that make it, does that render this otherwise unethical, immoral act moral or ethical? Um, again, there's no way to answer that question except to say that there are instances where uh, there are competing ethics and competing moralities. And I guess what I would say here is that the law generally permits journalists to do more than the law. I mean, in, I'm sorry. Uh, generally the law puts a floor on journalistic behavior. So that there are things that you can do that would be legal that you couldn't do ethically, journalistically. For instance, we talked about New York Times versus Sullivan the other day. New York Times versus Sullivan makes it very hard for a plaintiff to win a libel case against a newspaper. As we talked about, there's all these elements of libel that have to be shown. And for the most part, plaintiffs who bring cases are not successful in proving those elements. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's okay for journalists to willy-nilly make mistakes. Um, our ethics uh, concerns generally are higher than the legal floor. And there's a good reason for that, is that you don't want every mistake or every, uh, you know, uh, slip up to be punishable under the law. You want to create some room for people to, to make innocent errors. And that's a lot of what New York Times, New York Times versus Sullivan does. Um, but that's also consistent with other laws. For the most part, ethical standards are above those of, uh, of legal standards. There are, though, I think, sometimes when there's a question about whether you can go further than the law. Um, it's, I can't, as much as I rack my brain, I can't come up with a, an ethics defense for a journalist ever to commit murder. I mean, I talk about the, the Hitler case, but journalistic ethics don't, I don't think, allow for any room to kill someone in the pursuit of a story. If you can come up with an example, I'm all ears. But, um, uh, but what about other lesser crimes that you might commit, that a journalist might commit in pursuit of a story? What about making a threat? What about breaking and entering? Uh, what about trespass, um, fraud? 
What about receipt of stolen goods? I'll talk about that one in a minute because I myself happen to have been involved in a couple of those. Um, you know, these are legal issues. They are real laws. Um, but I would argue that there are times when it's worth breaking them, some of them, um, if the story warrants it. And I want to, let me start with a little example that did not occur to me, but that happened to a colleague of mine many years ago. Um, this is actually way back, a long time ago. Um, my former colleague uh, was working on a story about a psychiatric hospital. Um, and they already, he and, a, and a, another uh, colleague of his, uh, had already had been working on it for some time. Uh, and they had uncovered a shocking number of allegations of uh, bad things going on at this hospital. So my colleague toured the hospital with a group of dignitaries. I think there were some state legislators on the tour. I don't know all the details. If so, I've forgotten them. But, and there was this hospital official who was leading the tour. At some point during the tour, uh, my colleague pulls the hospital official aside into it and says, you know, come here for a minute. Can we talk for a minute? And they go off into a side room. And my colleague just starts asking him sort of run-of-the-mill questions. How's the family? How you doing? What's going on? And the guy's sort of puzzled, and he talks for a couple of minutes and says, you know, I, I really need to get back to this tour. Do you have something to ask me? And my colleague said, actually, what I, want, what I did here is I just pulled you aside, and all these people now think that you're a source of mine because we've gone off in the other room. So you better talk to me because if you don't, they're going to think you talk to me anyway. And at that point, the guy does later talk to my former colleague and helps flesh out a story that revealed um, uh, within this hospital that patients were being beaten to death. Uh, some were being forced to live naked and handcuffed for years at a time. Uh, there was a code in this psychiatric uh, facility among the guards that if one guard hit a patient, that all the other guards in the room would hit the same patient so they couldn't report on each other. Um, there was one patient who was forced to remain in custody at this institution for 26 years without receiving a psychiatric evaluation. So all of that goes into the story, which won a Pulitzer Prize and resulted in substantial reform to the psychiatric uh, institution. Um, so here's my question to all of you. Does that story and those revelations justify the threat that induced this source to talk? What do people think? What if he threatened to kill him? No. <laughs> um, I right. think that goes too far. I think, like you said, the murder is never justified in, like, there, I, don't, I don't see how murder would, I think threatening him like that it was appropriate, but no, that'd be going too far. I mean, it's sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> yes? I think what we're doing is, like, ethical, and what they're doing is not ethical. So I think that it definitely justifies. Does that, how far does that go, though? I mean, as I say, you, certainly you wouldn't, you kidnap his children and hold them for ransom until they talk to you. I mean, you know, at some point, there's got to be some limit to how far you can pursue it ethically. I noticed your sort of look of horror on your face as I was telling the story. <laughs> And I don't, I don't know the end. I don't know how hard he tried up to that point. Um, but it's a good question. I mean, certainly before anyone ever breaks a law in pursuit of a story. And I'm not sure whether this broke the law, although I'll bet this hospital official felt it did. Um, certainly, you should exhaust every other sort of legal and ethical remedy. Um, yes? I was going to say that, like, um, go through all the other options first. And also, like, I think, I don't know, I think that it's important that it doesn't, like, not threatening to cause physical harm or anything else physical harm. I, I get your point, and I think it's a good one. Obviously, physical harm is sort of an easy place to draw a line. Um, I guess the only thing I would offer, though, for consideration on that is that, you know, I'd rather get punched in the nose than have my reputation damaged, so, right? Because the punch in the nose goes away. Um, in some ways, physical harm can be much less damaging than reputational or psychological harm. Or, so while I think you're right, I mean, I can't imagine ever threatening a source with physical harm in order to get information. Uh, it's worth remembering that that may not solve the whole ethical uh, quandary. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Well, that's a good point, right. I suspect, and again, this is a long time ago that I learned this story, and so I, my, my memory is hazy on it, but um, I suspect that the answer is that this was the person who was in a position to defend the hospital, who they were trying to get to defend what the hospital was doing or describe what it was doing. So this was probably either the head of the hospital or an assistant director or something. I don't think he was picked because he was especially weak, although that's possible too. <laughs> um, yes? <clears throat> No question. And it really means that journalists are taking the law into their own hands in a very, uh, you know, literal way. Um, and that's uh, upsetting. Um, and, uh, you know, it certainly breaks, as I say, a kind of fundamental social compact, which is that we are all expected to obey the law. <clears throat> yes, I'll come back to you in a second. It's a good point. It's, it, is, um, it is certainly close to blackmail. <laughs> um, whether it is or not is a good question, though. I mean, it, and that this official could have just said, you know what, screw you. I'm going to go back out there and just tell them what you just did. It would have been an interesting response. I mean, if he had just come out and said to the group, hey, listen, this reporter just tried to, to stiff me into making you think he's my source, uh, that kind of that kind of might have solved the question. It would have created an embarrassing situation for my colleague. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't, know, I don't know for sure that there's a law broken here. Um, we're going to talk in a minute about some instances where there are more clear laws broken in the area of classified material, and, or at least there are more arguable ones. But, but yeah, I mean, there could be that. Uh, I guess the only thing I would say again to that, though, is that doesn't completely resolve the question either. Even if this is legal, you could argue that it's unethical. Um, but it's, it's clearly in that gray zone. Um, Yes, you have. Oh, yeah, it was very similar to what you mentioned, just that, like, I think it's, it's justifiable when you're playing on a situation that's already going to happen. When you're playing on, <coughs> oh, well, the public opinion of you is going to be this. Like, you're not physically doing anything to them. You're not saying anything about them. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and then it puts it entirely in their hands. Because he's not saying, and if you go out there and say this, I'm going to hunt you down. Like, right. he did say, well, this is the situation. You know, whatever right. You think it's descriptive. So, <laughs> Here's where we are together. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice way through it to kind of thread it's the needle not, on it. It's not like black and white. It's obviously there's still issues with it, but I'd say it's a lesser of multiple. Provocative, issues. right. Yes. Well, and to be honest with you, I don't know how much the source ultimately coughed up uh, in response to this. Um, but all I know is from his telling of this years later that it helped move the story forward. Um, and you, as you say, you know, unfortunately, when you, when you engage in that threat or whatever we're going to call it, you don't know. I mean, it may be that the source then says, all right, you know, here's all my files, have at it. Or it may be that the source says, you know, I'll, I'll answer your five questions and then that's it. There's, it's hard to know what path you're on um, with it. You don't do it, obviously, if you don't think the source has something extremely valuable to add to the story. And I assume that to have been the case. Yeah. This was not reported in the story, no. Um, uh, you know, good question. Um, there are certainly instances where the, the way one gets material gets into a story. Um, I'll tell you in a minute about a case that I was uh, intimately involved in where I did publish some material that was, you know, arguably uh, obtained illegally or unethically or described as you will. And part of my deal with the source was that I wouldn't reveal the source. So that was never reported. In other instances, uh, Pentagon Papers, for instance, um, the source initially was not revealed, but ultimately was to be Daniel Ellsberg. Um, so there are uh, some instances. I think in, in most cases, that's going to involve the relationship with the source and the understanding there. Um, but you're right. If you don't reveal it, and there's something, in some cases, the way that a news organization comes into the possession of information isn't terribly relevant to the information itself. But there are some instances where you know, the source might have tampered with material, might have held out. You know, if a source makes a decision, for instance, to give you a file 
it's very hard to know whether the source has given you the whole file. And if the source takes certain pages out that are damaging to the source, the, the source can be engaged in distortion that you might not even be aware of. And in those instances, I would say that probably how you came upon a piece of information would be relevant. There's something, again, in the material you'll read for Thursday about a practice that's very widespread in politics today called opposition research, um, where quite often, more times than I can count, for instance, uh, in my case, I've had the representatives of one campaign in a campaign come to me and say, here's some material that you ought to know about our opponent. Um, in those instances, it generally is relevant uh, who's provided the information because it's provided for a specific purpose, which is to defeat a candidate. Um, and that can end up being a bigger story than the material itself. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm afraid that's a sort of rambling answer to your question. But I would say that there certainly are instances where how a news organization gets information where that process becomes relevant, sometimes even bigger than the information itself. Yes, sir. I have a question like, regarding the situation. If you try, like as a journalist, you tried all the, you know, the right ways to do it, and you know like the top score, you think that they're acting unethically, how do you, how do you approach it? Like, well, you know, listen, there's a lot of ways. And this story, by the way, the ultimate story that these guys wrote um, is terrific um, and is full of information that comes from not from this uh, interaction. Um, former guards, um, former patients, families of former patients. Uh, there's a patient, just a terrible episode in here of a patient who's struck with, I think it was a baton in the throat and died. Um, well, uh, you know, his mom is interviewed. She, you know, talks about how when he went in, he was in a certain condition, and then after years of psychiatric medication, he got worse and worse and worse. And so there's all this other reporting. Now, whether, whether that reporting would have been enough without engaging in this, I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, but um, I, clearly, they didn't do this lightly. So I assume that that meant that they felt there was more that they needed um, in, term, in order to get the story in the paper. Yeah, Heather in the back. Did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Uh, no, but um, I definitely oh. think that the people in danger outweighs, um, like, I mean, threatening, maybe not threatening death or anything like that, but I think the amount of lives that were in danger that could have been saved, like, and they were, you know, because they were found out that they were made by that people, mm -hmm. definitely justified. I, I don't think there's any question but that the the story that resulted here was of utmost uh, significance and importance and made a real difference in the lives of really troubled, uh, vulnerable people. <laughs> so, you know, that's why I use it as an example here, is that it does sort of po poignantly frame the issue, that if the consequence of not engaging in this threat had been that this story didn't run in the paper, that's a very serious ethical price to pay on the other side for engaging in the niceties of how interviews are normally supposed to go and, and avoiding a threat. Uh, I thought, did you have one? I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, um, I was just going to say that what he did is threat. All he did was make the guy aware of something that would have happened just in going to talk to him. And I think that that guard hiding that information, it's the same way they say good liars need good memories. If he's <laughs> hiding that much stuff, he needs to watch his back. He needs to make sure he doesn't go with the reporter to a corner. I think all the reporter did, yeah, it's you know kind of a loophole or whatever. He didn't mm -hmm. necessarily. Yeah, and also I should be clear, I don't know that this person had engaged in any personal brutality or not. I think he's an administrator who may have known things, and that's why uh, my colleague wanted to talk to him. Um, but you're right. I mean, you know, if, if this administrator knew of, the, of this stuff happening at this hospital, and if he didn't, then that raises another set of questions. Um, if he knows of it and is refusing to talk about it, then, uh, you know, uh, he's not in a great ethical position either. <clears throat> Yes. I feel like the source kind of could like figure his way out of it. Like you said, he should have just gone back. So it was kind of his own fault. <laughs> it's hard to feel very sorry for this guy. <laughs> right. I feel like he could have found, like, I feel like he just wasn't that trapped. He could have just gone out of it. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, and I, I don't know uh, whether it was just happening too quickly for that to occur to him or what. Um, but uh, I certainly, he must have been startled uh, to be confronted with this. And it may just be that he didn't in the moment think to respond correctly. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, and I'm going to tell you a, an episode that I was involved in. Um, so this is your chance to tell me whether I'm ethical or not. Um, um, this, is, this goes back to the mid-1990s. Uh, and this is, you all won't remember this, uh, but you've heard a lot about it, uh, about this period uh, in, in my talks and when Kelly and Carlene were here. 
um, and Henry too, I think. Uh, early 1995, um, the LAPD was under a huge amount of pressure, the Los Angeles Police Department, under a huge amount of pressure. The Simpson, O.J. Simpson had been arrested in the summer of 94. Um, his trial was moving very quickly, and the trial very quickly turned on the LAPD itself. Um, there was, uh, some of you um, may uh, recall, uh, Mark Furman was a detective um, on, in the West LA Police Division. Um, he denied ever having used racial epithets, and then these tapes and transcripts appeared in which it was shown that he had. Um, the way the LAPD collected evidence um, and stored it was very much under attack by the defense team. So the crime lab people were very, uh, were under scrutiny. Um, you know, the defense team's position on that case was that Simpson was, uh, that there was a rush to judgment, was the phrase uh, of the hour, um, to, to try to convict Simpson, and that the LAPD either had framed him or had uh, intentionally ignored evidence that might have cleared it. Um, so that it's a very busy uh, and contentious time. And by the way, keep in mind, this is only a couple years after the riots uh, here, in which the LAPD had performed abominably uh, and allowed the riots really to, to take hold. So there was still a huge amount of apprehension about the police department in LA. Um, it is in that context, in early 95, I think it was January 3rd or 4th, somewhere in there, early January of 95, um, that the police commission, which is the civilian body that oversees the police uh, department, received a uh, written complaint uh, that Chief Williams, uh, Willie Williams is the chief who had succeeded Daryl Gates um, after Gates retired, um, that Williams had accepted free accommodations in Las Vegas, um, uh, which is not necessarily prohibited uh, for a police chief, but would certainly be frowned on. The police officers are discouraged from taking freebies. Um, and Las Vegas has a sort of special set of connotations. Um, so the police chiefs really ought not to be receiving free things uh, from casinos in Las Vegas. Um, they asked Willie Williams about it. He denied ever receiving any freebies, as he put it, I think. Um, he did that orally, and then he submitted a written reply to their inquiry. Um, uh, he then met with a lawyer, and he repeated those denials. So there's this whole sort of episode going on, largely out of public view. This was a, it was sent privately to the police commission, and it was uh, adjudicated by them. The police commission investigated it, um, and ultimately concluded that Williams lied to them, um, that when he responded that he had not received these freebies, um, that he was lying, and it reprimanded him for lying. Um, this was a big deal in part. Willie Williams was the first African American chief of the police department. Uh, he was a chief, as I say, brought in under all this uh, commotion. Um, so this was a very delicate and uh, hotly uh, debated issue within City Hall. Um, Dick Reardon, who was then the mayor, uh, upheld the reprimand um, of Williams. And then it went to the city council, uh, which was extremely fearful of, uh, the, of the racial implications uh, of this reprimand, um, and also the kind of larger you know, kind of context in which the LAPD was under fire. So it decided to overturn the reprimand of the police commission, but it never even opened the file that, that addressed why he was reprimanded. And they specifically chose not to open the file because they were worried that if they all took possession of the file, that someone, um, in this case me, uh, would get a copy of it and that they would be embarrassed by it. So they, they overturned the work of their police commission and their mayor, and they did it without any review of the evidence. Needless to say, the police commission and the mayor were furious. In fact, two police commissioners quit over it. Um, uh, but that, for the moment, seemed to resolve uh, the matter. Um, what it didn't resolve is what was in the file. That why had the commission um, reprimanded the chief? Um, and we didn't know, because the, now the chief no longer had the reprimand on his record. But there was no way of saying why, because the file was still private. Uh, so in September of 95, I got the file. Um, and I, to this day, can't tell you how I got the file. Um, but <laughs> I, I will tell you what was in the file. Um, the file showed that uh, Willie Williams had received uh, $1,500 uh, worth of comped rooms in Las Vegas. Um, there also was a set of allegations by his driver that he had on a number of occasions uh, solicited uh, free tickets for family members from Universal Studios. Uh, Williams denied, uh, did not deny receiving the comped rooms, but denied that that constituted a freebie, the way the commission had put the question to him. Um, and he did deny receiving the tickets, although it was unclear why the driver would say that he had received the tickets uh, if he hadn't. Um, the material was given to me, as I alluded to just a minute ago, on the condition that I not reveal how I got it. Um, 
I accepted it with the knowledge that Willie Williams would be furious. There was no question about that. Um, and also that he would allege that this was a violation of his right of privacy, that these are his personnel records. Um, and it was his position throughout that it was an invasion of his privacy to publish this, for anyone to give the material to me and for us to publish the material. Um, so we did it anyway. Uh, I did it anyway. Um, and we ran an A1 story on September 15th of 1995 um, that created a real uproar uh, in City Hall. There was then uh, you know, a whole huge question. Willie Williams sued the police department, or sued uh, the city of LA for the improper release of the records. I was asked to reveal my source. I refused. Ultimately, the city settled with Willie Williams, um, and he left. Uh, he was not given a second term. At that point, it was <laughs> pretty much out of the question. Um, so I, I, here's my question to you, and feel free uh, to come down any way you want on this. Is that ethical to, uh, I mean, Willie Williams' position is that what I did and what the Times did was an unethical invasion of his privacy, and arguably an illegal one. Um, did you ask the source? Did you, did you go to the source, or did the source come to you, and did you ask them to seal the records, or did they freely give them to you? Uh, well, first of all, let me say that I don't generally use the word steal the records, I guess, but um, um, uh, it is, it's, uh, but you've posed exactly a very good question, um, which is to say that I asked every person I could think of in Los Angeles government and outside it who might have had these records for a copy of the records. I wanted them bad. Now, I didn't pay for them. I didn't uh, ask someone to go take them out of a safe or to violate the law, but I said to everyone I could think of, um, if you get a hold of these records, I want them. Um, and eventually, I did. In fact, there's a little side story here. Um, 60 Minutes was doing a profile of Williams about the same time. And the 60 Minutes reporters, when they were doing their reporting, told people they were talking to that they thought I wasn't trying to get the records and so that the, they should give them to 60 Minutes instead. Um, so there was this real competition for these records. Um, and I never actually spoke to the folks at 60 Minutes about why they alleged that. but. Um, People, were, there was an active search for this document underway, uh, or these, this set of documents. And it is absolutely true uh, that I solicited the document. I didn't, it wasn't, it didn't just arrive on my doorstep. <clears throat> I asked people for it. <clears throat> um, I just have a question about why that's a really big problem that he was getting those. Well, that's a, that's a fair question um, that is, I would argue, sort of on the side of this. The commission's ultimate belief is, we asked you a question, and you lied to us. Um, that's what they reprimanded him for. If he had come back and said, yeah, yeah I, I got some free accommodations in Vegas, but they're the same accommodations that are available to anyone who gambles at the level that it's actually not. He wasn't really the gambler. It was his wife was the gambler. Um, <laughs> but, um, but you know, anyone can get these if you gamble $50,000 in a weekend. Or I don't know what the amounts were. But um, the commission would not have been thrilled about that, because it's not totally uh, great to have a police chief who's family is gambling in those amounts, but at least it would have been an honest answer. And I suspect it probably would not have resulted in a reprimand. Um, it might have resulted in them asking them to stop going to Vegas. This, I'm again complicating this a little bit, one other slightly stray fact that you should know in all of this is that William's time in Vegas, uh, the time that he was spending in Vegas was controversial for another reason, which is that he was there one weekend when there was a police officer who was killed in the line of duty. And he elected to stay in Vegas rather than return to be with the family of the officer. Uh, officers knew this throughout the department and were furious at him for it. So his whole um, you know, travels to Vegas was sort of controversial in its own right. But again, I think if he had answered this question differently, he might have escaped the reprimand. Yes, I think I cut you off there. Did you have it? Yeah. Yes. I feel like because you weren't the one who committed the legal activity at all. In that sense, it's not your ethical issue. I mean, someone else got the papers. They gave them to you. And on top of it, you made it seem like there was a crime race for the papers. Mm -hmm. Someone was going to get them. I mean, in this situation, someone was going to get hold of the papers. And you had to, like, you knew that. You knew 60 Minutes was going after these papers, too. So, I mean, they were going to get published anyway. At least this way you can put your own and take on the story mm -hmm. out, rather than someone else's? And um, so I take it as does that. competition, does uh, the, I mean, I, it's a <laughs> well-taken point, and certainly it was my view uh, at the time and since, but um, is, uh, does competition change the ethical considerations, though? I mean, I, to be honest with you, I can't tell you for sure that someone else would have gotten it. Um, I, I certainly worried that someone else would get it, um, uh, but, does, you know, are you allowed to do things in the competitive pursuit of a story that you wouldn't otherwise allow yourself to do? 
Yeah. yeah. Just because, I mean, I understand the idea behind it that you have to, you know, keep up with the pack, was it the pack reporters? Yeah, that's a phrase that's kicked around a lot in journalism, the pack, which is not a terribly savory one. But um, yeah, I mean, I think, but it does go to the question of competition. I mean, if you're, uh, you know, you're trying as a reporter to uncover things that other people don't have, um, and you don't want to get beaten uh, on a story. Um, I certainly was nervous that 60 Minutes would land this document before I did. Frankly, I'd love to say that I was worried because they would not give it the proper context or to construe it. I was worried because I didn't want them to get beaten on it. You know, I mean, as a personal matter, this is my department. I covered this department. This is my beat. Uh, my feeling was, you know, if anyone's going to get this, I should. Um, and I told a lot of people that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Still, That's know. a very basic ethics principle, the two wrongs don't make a right. Yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> I don't understand how that would like, help you just because you said that was a pack did it too. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're all wrong. I would agree uh, with that. Um, although I would also say um, uh, it is good that journalists feel pressure to be first. You don't want them to be wrong in first or to do bad things in order to be first. But you don't want a, com a completely complacent press either. So that uh, pressure, while it can result in bad behavior, it also encourages a good behavior, which is that it encourages people to work hard uh, and to get stuff, which in the end is really what it's all about. Um, yes? I think also that there, you have to be especially careful when there is competition, because I think it, it causes people to feel the need to just report it right away, and there's more of, of a, a risk of error. You know, like you have the whole, like, with Katrina reporting, for mm -hmm. instance, you know yeah. what I mean? I think um, at no experience in my life did that was that brought home more vividly than during the early stages of the O.J. Simpson case, um, where almost every major news organization made a ghastly error. Um, not at all, and not us, thank God. Um, but we actually adopted a rule uh, in that case that's been sort of sporadically followed uh, ever since, um, which is that we would not report even that someone else had reported something unless we could independently verify. So it's a pretty common practice in a story to say, you know, you all won't remember this, but there was a moment early in Simpson where there was a, the defense turned over an envelope to the uh, to the judge who was here in the preliminary hearing, um, and the big question is what's in the envelope. Um, and w at that point, we the Newsweek, I think it was, was the first to report that it was a knife uh, in the envelope, and everyone kind of thought it was a knife, but couldn't tell for sure. And we would not let ourselves just report that they and others were reporting it. We had to go find it out independently because so many people had made mistakes that we were concerned that we would end up reporting somebody else's mistake. Um, uh, but that's an example of almost the opposite of what you're describing, which is much more typical, which is in that kind of rush to cover a fast-breaking story that's attracted a lot of attention from different, you know, from different places. Um, to move too quickly. In that case, we said, we're going to impose a rule on ourselves that makes us work more slowly. Um, this, by the way, is a vastly more difficult problem today in an internet-based uh, journalistic environment than it was in a print, at least with a print newspaper. If, you know, if somebody else reported something in the morning, I had all day to try to figure out if it was true. Now you'd be under pressure to do it in 10 minutes. Um, so that this is, this is a problem that's getting worse, not better. <clears throat> yes? Mm. But I, I, I read it this week. It's the first time I'd read it in 10 years. Yeah. <clears throat> if you wrote it more on like, what Williams did or what like, the community did, because that's what the Supreme Court said in Williams. That's a good question. Um, the story, this story that appeared uh, in September of 95 was mainly framed as, for months there's been this debate about whether the commission was proper to rep whether it was right for the commission to reprimand Williams and there have been different tales of what happened what the actual investigation entailed here's what it says here's what the file says now keep in mind this is a file that was created by the police commission of its investigation Williams may have had a, a 
may not have agreed with it, although he was privy to the file. He had the file, um, so uh, he had the opportunity to contest it. But the way the story was framed was really about, um, here's an inside look at the investigation that has been roiling LA politics for months now. Um, and I hope, in that sense, relatively neutrally reported. Uh, I mean, the fact that it was being reported was not, obviously, to the chief's liking. Um, but his lawyer was quoted in it extensively. Um, she, her main objection um, was she did not contest the truth of the material or the, the truth that it was a true representation of the file. She contested what some of the information in the file said. Um, but she didn't deny that that was the actual investigation. She did vigorously object to it being released. Um, uh, in fact, rather angrily and occasionally profanely uh, objected to it being released. Um, uh, and then, you know, there was just, so there was, she was quoted in the piece, he was quoted in the piece, the commission was quoted only saying that it deplored the release of the material and denying that it was the source of the material. Um, uh, so all the parties were sort of wrapped in. Um, this happened to occur. I mean, I happened to obtain the material in the middle of the O.J. Simpson case, so there was, for me, it was a, it was a big week. Um, but. I do think that the, I don't think, no one ever raised any objections to the way the material was presented in the story, at least to my knowledge. <clears throat> Williams and I, by the way, continued to speak rather regularly after this ran, although it never was quite the same. Um, but, you know, so uh, he, you know, I, he, in that sense, I think recognized that what I was doing was a job, that I was not out to get him. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, I didn't, as I mentioned, pay for this material. But what if I had? What if I had gone around to people at City Hall and said, there's 5,000 bucks for anyone who can get me this file? Does that change the ethics of it? Because by the way, a lot of tabloid publications do pay for information. Um, and some British papers do routinely. And so it is, while it's generally not the accepted practice uh, in this country, it's not unheard of. <clears throat> would that make this less ethical? I think it would make it less ethical because we talked about how they're kind of doing the illegal act by giving it to you. In that case, I think it's you because you're definitely enticing them. Like, just asking someone, it kind of leaves it in their hands, but saying, I'll give you $5,000, like, that's a lot of money. Right. Um, what if uh, the pledge is something different? I want to hear your other answers on the money, too. But um, uh, it's not to offer the money, but to say, you know, it, I would really appreciate it. As a, as a professional friend, I would really love it if you could get me this document. Um, now, now the currency is not money, but it's sort of relationshipy. Does that? I think that's almost worse because that's like a, a very obvious conflict of interest almost if you're offering your friendship. Yeah, I mean, there's friendship and there's friendship. But let's assume that it's not, not that, yeah, I mean, that these are, that I'm going around to people who I cover and I like and they like me. And that you'll do something for them should they do Well, that's, uh, I would argue that one's clearly out of it. I can't go to anyone and say, uh, if you get me the document, I'll write a really nice profile of you. Then I'm using the paper and its credibility. Uh, to, that's, I would argue, completely out of bounds. And I didn't do that, by the way. Um, but uh, you know, the other one's a little more shady. Um, that you know, we've worked together. I've written all these stories. We trust each other. Help me out. <clears throat> yeah, as long as it's clear that there's no. You know, there's no quid pro quo. Right. Uh -huh. sure. I think um, that's exactly what you did, right? Something like that. <laughs> 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 but personally, I think it, it's like it might be a little unethical, but I think ethics, you have to consider the severity of the law. If it, it, I think it's different, you know, like a little enticement or coercion rather than, oh, if you don't do this, I'm going to do this. Or if there's an action, if there's a reaction to their action, then it makes it worse up, up to, you know, threats or... What if I had uh, been in a hall at police headquarters one day with someone who had this document and pulled him aside in front of other people, like I described in the psychiatric uh, hospital case, and then said to him, all right, now everyone thinks you're my source. You might as well go ahead and get me the document because everyone's going to think you did it anyway. I think, I think with, I with thought that, about that doing amount that. of time, <laughs> that amount of time to say, you know, F you and, and leave. I, in, in a psychiatric hospital, I think if someone's that willing to fall for something like that, then they were dying to spill, it, <laughs> spill the beans anyway. So take advantage of dumb yeah, people. I think, thing, right? I think they really could have just told, you know, probably could have just got at him and just tell him, hey, we know this is happening, this and that. 
you know, you might want to save yourself or make yourself look better and just go ahead and cooperate and tell me what you know. Um, I think when it comes to money issue, um, I mean, you can only report on what you're given, but you don't know how credible your sources are now because you're being enticed by money. Mm -hmm. That's completely unethical and out of the question. Um, Do you think people are less ethical when they're doing something for money? So that's, yeah. that's why the money skews it then, um, because they might do something they wouldn't otherwise do. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And then also I think that this whole issue is more about public figures and use of anonymous sources. I think that's really where like, the whole ethical <coughs> dilemma stems from. Mm -hmm. With that said, I think that the chief of police is a public figure. Oh, he's a consummate public figure. There's no yeah, question about exactly. that. Yeah. So I think that <clears throat> when it comes to sort of the right to privacy, you know, that boundary is a lot narrower than it would be for just the regular citizen. His, his claim against the city was sort of like the claim that Wen Ho Lee made um, in the sense, if you'll recall back to the Lee case, he didn't argue that the story was libelous. He didn't argue, I mean, there was really nothing to do to me. There was no action brought against the paper. Um, what he did is he went to the city and said, you have a responsibility to protect my private records. Somebody who works for the city has provided the Times with a, something of mine that is private. You owe me for that violation. Um, now, the, th the trick is, as it was in the case of Wen Ho Lee, although fortunately for me it ended sooner than that, is that then the city says, okay, you tell us who it is and we'll go hold that person accountable. And I wouldn't tell him. Um, and as it turned out, because Williams was leaving anyway, he didn't get a second term, they used his claim against the city to, to pay him a buyout so he would leave. Um, so they just settled the claim with him, I can't remember, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, but in theory, what they did is they resolved the illegal or the improper release of his records with a settlement that then expedited his departure. Um, but if it, had, if it had stood on, if it had kept going, then there would have been a real First Amendment or a real anonymous source question that you identify, which is, would I have been able to resist or would I have been in contempt for refusing to re reveal the name? It was, it was clearly an issue of major public concern. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, there is a little aftermath on this, and I won't spend all day talking about this, but um, uh, eventually um, the city attorney's office did an investigation to try to determine who provided me with the documents. The city attorney's investigation um, was then transmitted to the council under a secret. They were told, all the council members were told not to release it. Within one hour of them transmitting it to the council, I had a copy of that, too. Um, it was a very leaky environment. Um, and uh, in any case, that, uh, that was the council's reason in the first place for not wanting to accept the Williams file, is that they didn't want to be in a position of being accused of then improperly releasing it. And that's exactly what happened with the city attorney investigation. Yeah. How, would, how would your ethics have changed if during, during their, their investigation, they said, oh, we know who gave you it to them, and this guy's getting fired, and they had the wrong guy? Mm, that's a really good question. That would have been a hard one. <clears throat> um, you know, one of the hardest things in, in accepting material anonymously, either oral material or written material, is that it's very hard to then defend the person who's wrongly accused of providing it. Because you can't start clearing people. You know, I can't say, listen, the following 10 people definitely did not give it to me, so don't fire them. The other 20, they could have. I'm not saying anything about them. Because if very quickly, you know, you get to a point where they say, well, if you're willing to clear those 10, then we want you to clear 18 more or 19 more over here. You know, um, so uh, that, I'm happy to say, did not come to pass. What is this <laughs> right. came up? You know, of course, part of the answer, not, not, it's not a terribly satisfying one, is that if someone who didn't provide it might be able to show they didn't provide it because they wouldn't, it would be very hard to prove that someone did something that they didn't do. Um, so had that happened, I guess, you know, we would have sort of watched that closely, but it did not happen. So, <clears throat> yeah. so with the use of, like, technology that exists without permission and having anything to do It's very difficult. I mean, there has been there have been issues. Special prosecutors are uh, have uh, pulled phone records at the New York Times to try to conclude to determine who is, who's talking to who. Um, you know, I would certainly counsel any reporter who was working for me uh, that if they were meeting with an anonymous source, that they do it in person, that they not do it over the cell phone, that they not use email uh, in order to set up a meeting. You know, this even comes up um, in my expense account. You know, I mean, I take sources to lunch. Uh, 
well, if that's on an LA Times expense account, and you know this, and I am meeting with so and so at such and such an hour, and that person's an anonymous source, that could be discovered um, through credit card records. Um, I mean, it is extremely important to be very cautious about how you interact with sources uh, who are who insist on anonymity, um, and how you protect them electronically as well as otherwise. The other issue with electronic records that are at the paper is it's a real question: who owns those records? If I take notes on a conversation and I take them on the computer, and it's a Los Angeles Times computer. Um, there may come a point, and this is what happened to Matt Cooper in the, in the um, Scooter Libby case, is that he maintained that he wasn't going to reveal his source in that case. Fed was, you know, very uh, adamant about it. Time Magazine maintained, sorry, you took the notes on our computer. We're turning them over. And they really sold him out. Um, so that, that he ended up not protecting his source but not because of anything he did, but because time asserted ownership of his notes. Um, so that's a, you're right that the changing way in which records are kept and stored uh, doesn't, I don't think, change the underlying ethical principles of these issues, but it changes the way you try to, what you have to do in order to adhere to them. Uh, I remember asking uh, a law enforcement official, let me put it that way, um, uh, to run uh, criminal record checks on mayoral candidates. Um, just to see if they had history. Um, turned out they didn't. Uh, at least, at least that's what they told me. Um, but you know, this is dicey stuff, and it does. It generally doesn't involve the journalist breaking a law, but it often has a journalist in a position of asking a, another person to break a law, um, and then being bound up in protecting their anonymity later, um, which is a sort of double bind, doubly tricky. Um, all right, let me talk about an area in which. There is an argument that reporters uh, actually have broken the law, although whether it's a persuasive argument or not, um, you can be the judge. It is um, illegal in this country to uh, release classified material, um, but it's also often illegal to disseminate it once someone else has released it, or even to possess it. Um, and let me read you, there's this, this Title 18 is the uh, criminal code, uh, Section 798 of Title 18, the federal code, is directed at anyone who, quote, knowingly and willfully communicates, furnishes, transmits, or otherwise makes available to an unauthorized person, or publishes, or uses in any manner prejudicial to the safety of, or interest of the United States, or for the benefit of any foreign government to the detriment of the United States, any classified information. What's, what's the law number? It's uh, Title 18, Section 798. It's quite easy to look up. I just found it the other day on the internet. Um, OK, so that, that makes it a crime to knowingly and willfully communicate, furnish, transmit, or otherwise make available to an unauthorized person classified information. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's whether it is qualified by that phrase or whether that's a separate violation is a good question. Um, uh, yes, because it says, or uses in any manner prejudicial to the safety or interest of the United States. So some people read that to say that it has to be prejudicial to the safety or interest. Some people read it to say that if you do any of those things, or do the, or use it in a manner that's prejudicial. So it could be read either way. Um, we had a reporter. Um, uh, at the LA Times, who was uh, in Afghanistan, um, and he was in an Af a bazaar, you know, a marketplace uh, in Afghanistan, and found that you could buy on a flash drive in the bazaar um, classified information that had been apparently stolen from the US Embassy. So he bought it to see what it was. Um, he's now in possession of classified material. That is arguably a violation in and of itself. Now, he's in Afghanistan, which which also sort of tweaks uh, this a little bit. But um, it's also then, it, it's, it's very difficult to even give it back. Because to give it back, you have to possess it. Um, you know, the case that's probably best known in this area of the question of classified material and, and what are the legal responsibilities is the Pentagon Papers, which we've talked about a couple times in this class. In fact, I mentioned it earlier. Daniel Ellsberg uh, was an analyst at RAND, um, just a couple miles from here, um, who copied the Pentagon Papers, and delivered them to the New York Times, classified material. The New York Times published them. Um, then later, the Washington Post uh, and others uh, published them. So at that point, you could argue that the New York Times uh, transmitted that material, made it available to an unauthorized person, which is to say the readers of the New York Times, uh, 
certainly published the material. Um, now, whether it used it in a manner prejudicial to the interests of the United States or the safety of the United States, to your question, is a, that's a tough one. Because, you know, some people read that material and said it was, not only was it not prejudicial to the safety of the United States, it was essential to the safety of the United States to understand the history of this war. The Nixon administration obviously thought otherwise. Um, um, after the New York Times uh, later published the warrantless, the stories that we uh, talked about earlier in the course on warrantless surveillance uh, and the bank monitoring of Al-Qaeda uh, accounts, a guy named Gabriel Schoenfeld wrote a piece in the Weekly Standard arguing that Section 798, as well as the Espionage Act of 1917, um, both could be applied against the New York Times um, for its reporting in those cases. I'm sorry, <laughs> I thought you were holding your hand. Um, he, uh, he, and he noted in his piece um, <coughs> that Section 798 was passed in part because of some reporting not so different from what the New York Times was doing in the bank monitoring and the uh, warrantless surveillance cases. In that, in that case, uh, Section 98, according to Schoenfeld, um, it was in part motivated by the fact that there was a book published in the 1930s about the success that the Japanese government, um, or that the, success, the success that the United States government had had at breaking Japanese codes. Um, and that one response by the Japanese government to that book was to invest more heavily in, in codes that were more difficult to break. Um, so that there is an argument that Section 798 was specifically intended to thwart publication of material that might harm the United States. And it's Schoenfeld's argument that that's exactly what the New York Times did when it published um, those two stories. Um, and therefore, it, its reporters and editors ought to be prosecuted under Section 798. Um, Alberto Gonzalez, the late and not much lamented uh, attorney general, um, uh, at the time seemed to indicate that he was considering it. He said, and I'll, I'll quote to you from him, he said, there are some statutes on the books which if you read the language carefully would seem to indicate that that is a possibility, meaning a prosecution of the New York Times. Um, so I guess the question here is, here we have a strong argument, again, whether it's a persuasive argument is a different question, but that that the obtaining and publishing of classified information is, is in violation of Section 798 and arguably other statutes, should the New York Times not publish material that it has at least some reason to believe may be <coughs> illegal to do so? What do you think? <clears throat> Right, although keep in mind that's a judgment that's going to be made in a newsroom and second guessed by someone else. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what are the, um, what, the Freedom of Information Act does not compel the release of classified material. Um, uh, now, what you can do, and I do this all the time in the course of my book research, by the way, um, is when I'm at the Eisenhower Library in Abilene, my home away from home. Um, I'll often come upon a sheet that will say such and such a document has been removed because it's classified. It's notwithstanding the fact that these are 50-year-old documents. Um, what you can then do is fill out a form asking the government to review whether it's still properly classified. Because a lot of stuff was classified, you know, back in the, in this case, back in the 50s and 60s. And when they review it, they decide the people involved are dead or, you know, whatever. The, the reason for the classification has now um, passed. But I'll tell you, there's still a lot of material in, at the Eisenhower Library that's classified, nuclear weapons secrets. Um, you know, uh, deployment issues, whatnot. You can, so you, what I guess I'm saying is that as a citizen or as a journalist or both, you can appeal the classification decision, but, the, but if, it, if the government concludes that it is properly classified, the Freedom of Information Act will not help you get it. <clears throat> I mean, we go back to the, the kinds of analysis we were doing. We talked about the psychiatric hospital, the, the harm of the, you know, of the, of the wrong that is being disclosed versus the method used to get it. Um, here we have, on one hand, the possibility that reporters or editors would be prosecuted. Um, on the other hand, the disclosure of material, pretty hard to argue that these disclosures are not of the highest order um, uh, in terms of public consequence. Now, some people think it was reckless uh, to publish these warrantless wiretapping stories. Some people think it was reckless to publish the Pentagon Papers. Other people think it was an essential act of patriotism. Um, in, any, in any event, what no one argues is that it was inconsequential. They were clearly big, important stories. Um, 
So how do you weigh the, the threat of prosecution uh, versus the significance of the story? Come on, everybody has a thought on whether I was ethical. Is it any? I think you just have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, I think it is unethical and if you, just because you're breaking a law and you know you're breaking a if you know you're breaking a law and you still do it, then there, it has to be unethical. But why? Why does, does it have to be unethical to break the law? Was was it unethical for Martin Luther King to engage in civil disobedience? <laughs> okay, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> if you're if you're breaking a law, then you should be held to the same standard. I mean, just because you're a journalist, you can't hide behind that if you're breaking the law. Is what I'm getting. You may get prosecuted, right? Yeah. You, <clears throat> just because, well, I'm a journalist, you know, I have these freedoms. Like, if you know you're breaking the law, then you can't use that. But at the same time, if I think if the story has such a high magnitude and it outweighs your belief in what you think that personally, like, well, I think this story is better than, you know, what I'm, the repercussions I'm going to get for breaking the law, then, you know, go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gabriel. Just more practical. Yes, well, there's a different um, way to, to ask these same questions, which is, could you win? You know, um, this comes up, you know, in, in my instance of Willie Williams, the question was, if we refuse to disclose the source, are they going to come after us? Well, the idea is, let's kick that down the road. We think we could win it ultimately, but let's see. Here, it is clear the New York Times position that Section 798 is not intended to thwart publication, that it's intended to thwart spying and <coughs> disclosure to an enemy. Um, what the people who criticize the New York Times, though, argue is that it specifically says publish, uh, and it specifically grows out of a dispute over a publication. So, you know, that would be contested in court. And uh, would you win? Would you not? That would clearly be part of the court. I mean, you know, Bill Keller, the editor of the New York Times, presumably does not want to go to jail for publishing these things. So he would defend himself, and the reporters would, too. Um, now, as it turned out, there was no prosecution here. But the, the legal analysis is a little bit separate, I think, from the ethics analysis. Because what I'm asking the question is, even if you know you might be breaking the law, um, whether you could successfully defend yourself or not, are there times when you need to do it anyway? Um, and that's the sort of intersection of the ethics conversation with the legal conversation. Yeah. And then do you just do it as an act of civil disobedience? Do you just accept that you've broken the law and go to jail? Or do you contest it? You contest it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you're there for. Society needs journalists, needs watchdogs. And so they're filling an important role. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be thrown in jail. It's, it's, it's like tricky, but they shouldn't be thrown in jail for doing their job, even though not everyone in society appreciates Gets it. Gets it, right. In the back. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that you know you're going to jump in the water for, I mean, you, you just got to do it and know, know the consequences of it, you know, because if you're defending that principle, if you don't defend that principle then, then when will you defend it? And if you never do, then what are you doing? In that instance, then, really, you're, you're arguing then is that the, the ethical imperative to publish trumps the law. <clears throat> Part in, in the case of the Pentagon Papers, for instance, um, I mean, first of all, it's hard to speak of the government in this case, because obviously the government has a lot of facets to it. But um, it was certainly an argument um, offered by the Nixon administration that the publication of these papers would contribute to undermining public support for the Vietnam War, and that the pursuit of the Vietnam War was in the interest, the successful conclusion of the Vietnam War was in the interest of the American people, and that therefore this publication Whatever the New York Times thinks about its utility is, in fact, that they're wrong. That, in fact, this is 
uh, this is bad for the American people, that it is not in their interest to have their confidence undermined uh, in this war. Um, now, I guess my point there is, you know, I forget who was the editor of the New York Times when this was published, but, um, you know, Richard Nixon's view of what's in the national interest is not always going to match the view of the editor of the New York Times, uh, you know. Um, certainly, the Bush, George Bush's belief on the warrantless wiretapping stories uh, and the bank monitoring stories is that those harmed Americans uh, by being published, and it was the position of the New York Times that the programs harmed Americans, <clears throat> or at least arguably did. I uh, agreed to, but I would also just pose to you that it's one thing to say that when the publication conforms with your sense of what's in the best interests of the United States. What about when, you know, when James O'Keefe goes and exposes Acorn's violations? Does that have the same majesty to it um, as when the New York Times publishes the Pentagon Papers? Because he absolutely believes that exposing Acorn was in the interests of, you know, was in the national interest, that this is an organization that is in some fundamental way corrupt. Um, He's doing it for a different set of motives than the New York Times is publishing the warrantless wiretapping stories. But in the end, they would both make the same argument that whatever the subjects of those stories think about it, that they're acting in a kind of higher interest. Um, and they're, they are themselves making that judgment about what that interest is, not asking a judge to make it, not, ask, you know, not asking a neutral party to make it. Bonding what came first, uh, people not trusting the information they were being given by the government about the war or the Pentagon Papers. I mean, people I mean, I know right. people are There's a lot of water under the bridge by the time yeah, the Pentagon well, papers came like out. They, you know, the New York Times has had it out for Nixon, and, and they just wanted to you know, make people not agree with what he was saying. People already felt that way, and here they had information to give people that would substantiate what everyone was starting to, to feel. I mean, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's when discussion is really important. Yeah, no question. Right. Uh, ideally, the answers to these questions are not found in one's political beliefs. Um, that the, the disclosure of the Pentagon Papers or the decision to publish them shouldn't be any different if Lyndon Johnson is president or Richard Nixon is president. Uh, that these ought to be ideologically neutral principles. Um, it's hard, though, it's, frankly, uh, to, to, to find that place. Um, because it's hard to recognize the, only, the degree to which your ideology influences your assessment of what's in the interests of the country or the readership. Um, because what feels like, you know, I mean, there's a, well, this is a diversion. I won't bore you with it. But I, it is a, oh, I, I, let me just note there that what, when you, when you put yourself through that test, are we doing something that's good for the public here? It's hard to strip away all of your ideology, all of your other beliefs in order to do that. I don't think it's impossible, but it's an important exercise to go through. Um, and, uh, and one that will be second-guessed by people who don't share your ideology. Um, yes? I was just going to say, I think our system kind of works perfectly, because the journalists are you know, trying to expose things, the government's trying to cover them up, and eventually you reach <laughs> kind of a mutual kind ground. Of the two. You know, right. Because, I mean, if journalists reported every single thing they wanted to, then there would be some things that they reported that were against national security, whereas... Right, although you can imagine a situation. Imagine it's, you know... 1945, and the United States is developing an atomic bomb, and there, there's a journalist who believes absolutely that the best thing for international security would be for the Soviet Union to have the bomb, too, because neither side would be inclined to use it if both had it. This, is, this was the ideological motive of some of the spies um, uh, in that period. Um, and that that's an absolutely uh, considered viewpoint, um, and in this case, forget spy and say it's a journalist. So does that justify then publishing the plans for the atomic bomb. Um, you know, in a, I guess the reason I put it that way is just to sort of test the hypothesis that, that this thing, this all sort of works its way out. There would have been real consequences for a news organization that published plans for the atomic bomb in 1945. Um, and they wouldn't have been pretty. Um, and there might have been real consequences for the world. I mean, we might have had uh, people out there building bombs. Um, a lot more of them and a lot earlier. So I guess my only point is just that those judgments um, and that balance between secrecy and disclosure um, 
yes, it's true that the government protects a lot of material that ought to be released, but the government also protects some material that shouldn't be released. Uh, so it's not just about, you know, sort of to-ing and fro-ing. But that's why I feel like it works, because the government is, both are trying to do the best they can, mm -hmm. pretty much. So it's eventually going to work its way out. So, like, journalists obviously don't want to break the law and go to jail, so they're not going to publish right. things that really shouldn't be published. I, I think you're absolutely right that over the long view of history, these things have tended to work reasonably well. Um, that doesn't mean that in every instance they've worked out right, though. <clears throat> Who else? We have just a minute or two left. Um, all right, well, listen, I was going to go on um, and talk about a couple other issues in terms of personal conduct uh, about um, dedication to principle and honesty and compassion. Um, but that seems like a lot to bite off in four minutes. Um, so uh, why don't I do this? I will kick those over into Thursday. Um, to, don't forget to get a copy of the reading on your way out. It, you'll deal with some of these issues. Uh, and I will see you Thursday. Thanks. <clears throat>